Hello everyone, my name is Kevin McAleer and I am the author of the epic poem Errol Flynn, An Epic Life. It was published in 2018 by Palmar Press. We're presently in the Palmar Press premises here in Berlin, where I also call home. And uh, as I say, I'll be reading an excerpt. This is early in Errol Flynn's life when he was still in Australia. He was born in Australia, actually in Tasmania, an island off the southern coast of Australia. And this is uh, when he's about 20, 21, 23, I don't know, something like that, in his early years. Young Errol harbored ambitions to rise in Sydney society, and to that end, gained a fiancé. Did I not apprise you of this turn of events? Well, the sad fact is that Flynn had been rather unwise and something of a precipitate lad in swearing his love to Naomi Dibbs, this one of his more unfortunate fibs. For Errol, this woman signified class because she was part of the upper crust. He, for his part, handling her like cut glass, containing somehow his powerful lust, never unsheathing his manly cutlass, never betraying Naomi Dibbs' trust that theirs was a love on a higher plane, but leaving his lower parts in acute pain. They'd been engaged now for almost three years, but what, in fact, would it mean to marry? Love, joy, and laughter? Blood, sweat, and tears? His parents' union had made him wary of marriage, bearing out all his worst fears, and his own life now presently very unsettled and riddled with question marks, at which point he met a certain Madge Parks. This likely wasn't the lady's true name, Flynn changed it in Wicked, his autobiography. You'll soon see why. And did I say, lady, try one gorgeous dame, the kind of woman to make a rabbi drop kick his Talmud and loudly declaim the Kama Sutra, or a fierce samurai bust both his swords right over his knee and go off on a sake drinking spree. Statuesque she was, sporting auburn hair with heavenly, or if you like, hell of a figure while also wafting an air of tact and breeding. And in a nutshell, she was charming, witty, and had savoir faire, along with a touch of the Jezebel, a scarlet woman, as it were, you see, our siren married and now pushing 40. Urbane, well-traveled, spirited, and gay, she enjoyed swimming, also liked to dance, was stylish without being recherche, the kind of female who perforce enchants. And what I guess I am trying to convey is that Errol's first hot and heavy romance, his first real woman, indeed was no other than the doppelganger of his mother. And she was wealthy. In nights dining out and after drinks at a ritzy dance place, Never was there the shadow of a doubt who'd treat, and she did it with faultless grace, not in the business of trying to flout the unspoken rules, she leaving no trace of just how the bill had been settled since they'd walk out of somewhere and it simply be paid. And Madge adored sex. Adoring it so that Flynn was a rapid convert to the school of thought that holds that the female libido emerges more active and does not cool in middle age looms with a big 4-0. However, as Flynn himself aged, and here you'll no doubt smile wryly, his special delight was girls decades shy of their sexual height. But sex was her thing, and she Flynn's training ground. Her own needs so great that the constitution of our phallic star, later so renowned, was undergoing a dissolution. And one night, after another hard round, feeling like he could use a transfusion, Flynn arose feebly from Madge's mattress, relieved to escape her scorching caress. She lay there sleeping, a vision, a dream, her arms outspread with her beautiful hair, spread on the pillow, and a thing supreme, her figure with thighs designed to ensnare for some hips, yet not too broad in the beam, Tight waist and her breasts, good lord, what a pair. 
He took all this in, and then Errol's gaze began another vision to appraise. Spread over the dresser, there gleamed manifold jewels and colors and sizes assorted, a number of rings and others with gold or silver chains. He'd often escorted Madge out with these rocks, but now to behold all of these gems together here hoarded, brought home to Flynn just how much she was worth, while calling to mind his own fiscal dearth. To Errol it seemed that in their affair, Madge Parks was getting a far better deal. She took him to places with long stemware, all places that had a strong snob appeal. He'd had his fill, though, of fine camembert, and even for his sex now had lost his zeal, because, far from paradisiacal, her needs had grown nymphomaniacal. His gaze drifted from the dressing room table, away from the lustrous and dazzling jewels, and back to those legs to rival Grable and bust to incite Pavlovian drools and curvaceous hips, both willing and able, and face over which men had once fought duels. On Madge, his eyes lingered for a short while, wrestling with his conscience, her or the pile. It was clear there were no prospects for Flynn and Parks. Errol still had big, albeit somewhat vague, plans for his future, which in, so far as he was able to see it, wasn't in Australia, he by no means sanguine, so there remained little choice but to flee it, and since Madge was getting constantly laid, Flynn felt he ought to be consummately paid. In other words, it didn't take long for Errol to choose a firm course of action. He knew emphatically that it was wrong, far the most dastardly malefaction he'd yet committed, but the urge still strong. So in his state of near stupefaction, he started dressing oh so stealthily, then snatched up the jewels as his rightful stud fee. <laughs>